What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. I'm very excited to have a first time guest on this channel, Lawyer Lee, who is at the Delphi trial. She is there watching Richard Allen, watching the witnesses, watching the prosecutors, watching the defense lawyers, and most importantly, seeing the jurors and understanding what's happening in this case, bringing somebody there, boots on the ground. We talked to Andrea last week, and it's really important that we have lawyers who are seeing what the cameras are not showing in this case behind the closed doors so we can see what that process and hear what that process is actually like. And hopefully we get justice in the case. Hopefully it's a fair outcome. What that outcome will be, I don't know because I'm not there, but I'm really excited to have Lawyer Lee with us today. Lee, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So I haven't had you on before. I've watched your channel before on a number of different cases, but especially Delphi. I'm trying to get as much as I can since I can't watch the trial myself. But tell everybody listening a little bit about your background, um, how you started doing YouTube and how you got interested in the Delphi case. Okay. So I, I've been practicing for more than 30 years. Um, and my son actually got me into YouTube. He talked me into starting a channel, kind of tricked me into starting a channel. I so upset me when somebody was actually watching one of my live streams that I just clicked off. <laughs> and I just I, I went off of YouTube for like six months or a year. But about Debt V Heard, I really got interested in teaching people because I saw a lot of questions out there and I realized people didn't fully understand. So that's kind of my bent is just helping people understand how the law works. For the Delphi case, the reason I got interested was because of that Frank's memo. And mm. then all of the numerous rulings against Richard Allen, because I feel so strongly that we have a constitutional right as American citizens to a public trial, a speedy and a public trial. And that's critical that we have that. And when I saw over and over again, his, you know, the ruling seemed to be against him. I thought, I'm really concerned. I, I want to know, does he get a fair trial? Is that happening? Because it matters to all of us. And so you go down, you sit there six days a week, not five days a week, but six days a week court on Saturday, right. which is wild to me. I talked to you before we started. Neither of us have tried a case where six right. days a week we're going to trial. And you even mentioned half the time we're in trial, it's like a half day here, or we'll yeah. skip a Friday there. We've got a holiday on Monday and it's actually a lot more of a relaxed schedule because you all have practices. We have other clients. We have motions that pop up, even depositions we have to do in the middle of trial sometimes. But this case is an absolute grind for the lawyers and you guys that are there sitting in and watching. I've heard it hasn't been the easiest to get in the courtroom and view everything that should be available to the public. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's truly not easy. And in fact, for the first week and a half to two weeks, all of us who were really interested in the case, we were staying up and we were getting up. We were being down at the courthouse. There was one morning I arrived at 3.45 a.m. and that was not early enough. And I didn't get into the morning session. And, you know, I just put that out. I mean, I was, I was down to, you know, getting there at two in the morning. I do my live stream. I get an hour and a half of sleep. And then I'm down there again just to be able to get in to see what's supposed to be a public trial. And it was just so incredibly difficult. There are only 24 seats in that entire courtroom. And so that means, you know, not many people are going to get in. And, but if you're going to have coverage, you really need to see the whole trial. You mm -hmm. really need to be able to present it to people. So, you know, I just sort of, I think people on the channel saw how hard I was struggling to do that. And people just started to write and say, you know, I'll sit in line for you. I'll stand in line for you. And you know, it's like crowd surfing for YouTube. I mean, it's unbelievable. I just kind of like threw myself back and all these people are there and they just catch you and they show up and they wait in line for you. And we kind of got organized around it after I um, accidentally sent both Mike and Michael <laughs> to the line one night. Somebody else got in charge of the administrative stuff and it, it's been amazing. So they sit in line and I'm able to get in and just be there during the trial itself and then come home and tell people about it. And it's amazing how much people want to know about that case. And they recognize there are only 24 seats. Let's put some lawyers in there who can tell us about what's happened. Yeah, I think, number one, so many people focus on the trolls and the negatives and the bad people on the internet, which there are plenty, but it's really cool to have a community that does lift each yeah. other up, carry each other, help each other out, especially when it comes to justice and learning about the justice system and trying to do what we can. Because I tend, I used to think nobody watched I'll just say me. I, I used to think nobody watched this channel that that like was involved in these cases and whatever it may be. 
But now I think I have a different understanding that I think there are people in that courtroom who know who you and Andrea and Bob and all these people that are there watching for the right reasons. I think there are at least a few people in that courtroom who know exactly who you are. And while they don't have the cameras there keeping them accountable, I think they do have some of the YouTube lawyers there hopefully keeping them as accountable as they're going to be because it has sounded like there's some issues there and we're going to get into them. Um, but we heard from Andrea a lot of the, the first week of evidence and you know the ballistic stuff and maybe some of the weaker evidence from the state, the interrogation, which sounded like it was uh, pretty decent for Richard Allen. But I really want to focus with you on the confessions. We knew they were coming. Um, I've tried cases on both sides that have confessions, prosecuted cases and defended cases that have confessions. I don't think I've ever had a not guilty verdict on either side when there is a confession, especially a recorded confession. So I know there are issues with it. And I know the defense is trying to build context around them, but just give me your perspective of being in the courtroom, listening to these different confessions from Richard Allen. What's the jury thinking? What's kind of the feeling now that that has come out since we heard from Andrea week one? They, I think are the crux of the case. I think you're exactly right. When you have a confession, that's the first go-to issue that the jury's going to be paying attention to because those are the words of the defendant saying, I did it. And he said it over and over and over again. We heard before the trial got started, the prosecution talking about 61 different confessions. Now, wow. they decided not to present all of those. They only presented the ones from the guards, not from the other prisoners and the ones from phone calls he had, and then the ones from his psychologist, so the prison psychologist. So mm -hmm. there have been a lot of them. And, you know, a number of them you could just dismiss because, and uh, dismiss, that's too strong a word, but they at least fit within the defense argument. The defense argument is this guy is being treated so barbarically in prison that he's being forced into a confession. He was held in solitary confinement for 13 months in the same cell, let out at most three times a week for an hour and once a month to see a psychologist. And his psychologist also came to see him, but I understand it was only once a month. It may have been more during periods when he was under an unaliving watch. But some of them, like... For, from um, April 8th, there was one, I'm ready to confess. I swear to God, I killed Abby and Libby. F you, Ryan. No, but who's Ryan? And then, then he says, Fox trot, Foxy lady, Fox something, no one in the courtroom caught. He was yelling, and then he was drinking toilet water. He was drinking a bottle of hot sauce, urinating on a sleeping mat, you know, all in one day, just bizarre, crazy behavior. Ultimately, it became so bad they gave him involuntary shots of Haldol. Hmm. But there were three that were a little bit more than that and where it wasn't as obvious that there was a psychotic break going on around it. And so I, I thought I'd also tell you those three because I think they were pretty important. Um, the uh, the there were There was one to his psychologist, Monica Walla, and he told her a lot of really specific things about what he said happened with the crime, that he went to his parents' house, bought a six pack afterwards, instead of going to lunch with the family, he drank three of those. He bundled up, he went to the trail, he laid in wait, he saw the girls and he followed them on the bridge. He says he thinks a gun, a bullet fell out of his gun there at the bridge. He ordered them down the hill. All of that fits with the crime. And he was going to SV them, and that was his plan. But a van suddenly came up, startled him, and he didn't end up, ended up not following through with his plan for the girls. Instead, he caught he cut their necks and killed them to get rid of the evidence against him. That's really specific. You know, the prosecution has latched onto one fact in that, and that's the van. They said he saw a van and it startled him. And they're trying to prove that a van went right down that road at that very time. And in fact, that I mean, they have a witness who says, I drove my van down that road. On the other hand, uh, the defense is trying really hard to get in an FBI interview of that guy saying, yeah, I didn't come straight home from work, meaning he wouldn't have been there at that time. Mm -hmm. The defense is saying these are facts that he knows because of the fact that he's present. Um, 
and getting discovery. And so he's finding out about the facts of the crime. These aren't him actually knowing these facts or knowing anything unique about the crime. He's in this How are they getting that out? State. How are they getting those details out? You're talking about the defense? Yeah, how are they getting well, the fact that he's getting this in discovery? Because they can't testify. Richard Allen hasn't testified. So how are they getting that information out that he would have seen this in discovery? They were the ones telling him this. Richard Allen knew these facts from somebody before he confessed to them. How are they getting that information in? One of his behaviors related to tearing up his discovery and throwing it around his cell and stuffing it down the toilet. And so that much is in. That's one of the reasons they changed from having inmates to guards watching over him. So we do know about that. And okay. I, they have put their paralegal on the stand um, twice now. And I thought he was going to testify. We sent him this. We sent him these things. I think he still will, but he hasn't said that yet. Okay, so, so, so that's something that you know is coming, but we haven't heard the evidence of that yet, that Richard Allen knew those facts before he confessed from some other reason than he was actually there doing it. We've certainly heard that argument. We've heard that argument both in questioning of witnesses and in the fact, and in the in the opening statement, then in the questioning of the witnesses, and now we're hearing it. Lots of talk about it, but no, I don't think there's evidence he had photographs of the scene. I don't think we have that yet. So yeah, and that, that to me, so, and I've, I've seen all sorts of people reporting some people I don't know as well. So it's take certain things with a grain of salt. Um, but certain confessions seem to be exactly what you're saying, more convincing than others. And I think that we have to prepare ourselves for the very real possibility that this guy could be getting a totally unfair process. The judge could be stepping all over his rights. He could be unfairly confined to solitary, um, and all these just atmospheric pressures that are completely unfair and nobody in America should ever be under that sort of supervision and that sort of restriction while they're presumed innocent waiting for trial. But it's also possible that he did do it as well. I'm not saying he did. We don't know. We'll see what the jury ends up finding. But that is a possibility that, you know, I'm trying to keep an open mind to because it is really frustrating for me to watch what this guy's going through. And it seems completely unfair. Um, even if he did it, it seems completely unfair because of the presumption of innocence at this point. But those types of confessions, that's going to be difficult for the defense to get over with lay people on a jury, wouldn't you think? I think it will be very difficult. And a lot of the jurors' questions have been around those around those facts. You know, can it be that somebody confesses this many times over and over and they're in psychotic break? Would you would you be able to come up with this cohesive story? And then some of the most difficult were the confessions to his wife and to his mother, where mm. his mother says, you know, just because you're thinking it doesn't mean it's true. He said, well, it is true if you actually did it. I mean, oh. he really seemed to be responding to her. It didn't seem as if he was just ranting and raving like a lunatic. It seemed like he was having a discussion in which he wanted to accept blame. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be real hard for the jury to get past. So many days used to go by where I would feel gross because I've done nothing but eat and sit at a desk all day. But AG1 is such a great jumpstart to reminding me how important being healthy and active is. And AG1 is such a huge part of elevating my healthy morning routine. In just 60 seconds, I get my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, adaptogens, and more. And that's why I love starting my day with AG1. I never knew how important gut health was until I started looking into AG1, and now I notice a difference with improved digestion and less of that bloating feeling. So start with AG1 and notice the difference for yourself. It's a great first step to investing in your overall health, and that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with them. Try AG1 and get a free bottle of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash L-Y-K. That's a $48 value for free if you go to drinkag1.com slash L-Y-K. Make sure you check it out. Today they, they saw video, they, not we, saw video of Richard Allen in the prison they turned the TV so that we could not see it. But you can see the jury really being affected by that. But I completely agree with you. There are two different tracks that are really important here. One is his fair trial, and the other is the way we're treating prisoners. Those are not necessarily exclusive. It could be that he's guilty and he's being treated unfairly, and we need to do something about the prison system that's creating this, this dramatic effect on him. And what I say all the time in these cases is, 
I want to be confident in the verdict and the ending of this case, right? I want to be confident that justice was served and they've already thrown so much. They being law enforcement, prosecutor, judge, the, the jail facilities, like they've already thrown so much into this case that makes you question the process in its entirety. That's not the feeling anybody should want in America at the end of a case where it's like, are we sure? Or did he get jobbed here? And that's the worst feeling at the end of the case. Right. And it definitely seems like his lawyers think he's innocent at this point. Um, and from my perspective, I just, I hate to see that because if he is guilty, I'd like for him to be convicted and I'd like for it to be a fair trial and everything done above board and the public having access to it and everybody being confident in the verdict and the ending. But it seems like we're not going to get there regardless. But um, you said there were three confessions. So you you mentioned one. Uh, what are the other two that you felt like were pretty strong for the prosecution? So um, one of them was uh, to his wife, uh, and it was a pretty coherent conversation during the same period when he's off, he's psychotic and doing some real crazy stuff. And he says, you know, it's true. It's true, honey. I did it. And I did it, dear. I killed Abby and Libby. I need to know someone's going to love me no matter what. And there are six like that, not just one, but six times. And they go back and forth. And then the other one would be the mother. And the back and forth there was, I'm afraid you won't love me because of the fact I said I did it. And she says, you know, just saying it doesn't mean you did it. And the, his words are, it does if you did it. She says, don't talk like this. I think they're just messing with you. And he says, no, mom, they're not. I did it. I just know you don't have it in you to do something like that. And he says, I wouldn't tell you I did it if I didn't. And so that's really strong. I mean, that, of course, he also told law enforcement repeatedly, you know, I'm not going to confess to something I didn't do and I didn't do this. And the jury has seen these completely different people. The confident guy who was interviewed before he was put in prison, who was just like, I didn't do this. I don't know what you're talking about. And I, I don't care what you say about the bullet matching my gun. I wasn't there. I didn't kill her. I'm not confessing. And then you've got this guy saying over and over, I did it. I did it. And it's, very big difference contrast. Yeah. I think actually when, when, from what I heard about the interrogation and even some, you know, videos and thing from the interrogation, he acted like most lay people believe innocent people act. They don't think innocent people call lawyers, even though a lot of them do and they should, they don't think innocent people talk to, uh, you know, somebody before talking to the cops. They don't think innocent people hide their phone or don't just turn over everything willingly and say, search whatever you want to search. But he kind of acted like lay people think innocent act, innocent people act, where he gave them what they wanted. He talked to them. He denied, 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 said, go ahead and arrest me, called their bluff. So all of that I thought was pretty good for the defense. But then later when you come back and have these confessions, especially the ones you're defining as coherent and not seeming like psychotic breaks, which again, when you have it mixed with the ones that seem like maybe there was other things going on, gives a lot more credence to the, the you know, episodes where he was confessing as well. That's exactly how they expect guilty people to act. And maybe, you know, from the prosecution standpoint, making an argument that I think a lot of lay people would agree with that once he was sitting in jail for long enough, he was like, the shtick is up, whatever. I'll just admit to it now. I'll admit to what I did. And not that he was forced to, but that he knew it was over. He knew he was going to get convicted. And so he just decided to admit it to get the guilt off of his chest or off of his back, whatever it may be. And that's what people do. And that kind of argument, I think, might play with the prosecution and, and how they're kind of going down the road. And they're playing. There was a period of time when he says, I accepted Christ and this has changed my life. I want to confess and okay. talked about that. And so the defense says that's hyper religiosity and that's him, you know, just moving into religion too far, being controlled by that. And I think the prosecution without saying it is just saying, Hey, maybe the guy felt guilty. Maybe the guy really did do what, say he wanted to go to heaven. As he said, he wanted to be with his family. And therefore he started confessing, thinking it would make a difference. Yeah. Confessing his sins. Right. I mean, that's yeah. people will track with that. And in my experience, jurors will track with things like that. If you can give them a reason. And I didn't, I had not heard that fact before you just told me. Um, but, but people will look for a reason as to why did he confess then? And that's a pretty good reason, right? Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it or whatever, they're at least giving the jury a reason why he confessed. Then the defense is too, right? They're saying he's been abused. 
He's been in these horrible conditions for 13 months. He's a different man now than the confident man denying. They've got arguments. I get it. And, and it's probably on the spectrum of false confessions, a very small minority of, of confessions are false confessions or proven to be false confessions. But the ones that do, they've got a lot of the evidence that the defense has in this case that they are trying to present to show these are false confessions. And before we get to the defense's case in chief, is there anything else that you think we need to talk about with the confessions or even the end of the state's case in chief? It seemed like it went a little quicker than people were expecting. It really did. Um, they tried to end with a surprise video. Apparently recently, about two to the last two, three weeks, there was a, an incident in the Cass County jail where he'd been moved. I heard, the no one else heard, but I mean, in terms of it wasn't brought out in court, but rumor background I heard, they had taken his wife and mother off the call list. So he was upset. So he apparently had an utter meltdown and he was screaming profanity, according to the prosecution, extremely irate, pounding on the door to his cell, telling the guards he was going to effing kill them. And the prosecution wanted to play that in court. Now, to me, that's an easy no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't play that in court. This is not related to the murder of Libby and Abby. But the uh, the prosecution argued, well, that door that door has been opened by some of the questions that the defense asked, which were suggesting, hey, he stopped confessing because he's in better treatment now. And in fact, he's still way off the reservation. So at that point, the judge ruled with the defense. It was sort of a surprise because the judge has rarely ruled with the defense. But in this particular case, the judge said, no, it's not coming in. And then they put in some Google searches that he had done. They put it in without a witness. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. I don't think I've ever seen it. No witnesses on the stand. Somebody had authenticated it beforehand. And then there was going to be there were going to be some additional about rulings and back and forth. And they just handed it out to the jury and the jury read it over. They weren't all that big a deal. Interestingly, though, we never got to see those. We had to read in the newspaper what exactly had happened because the media is allowed to look at the exhibits at the end of the day, but YouTubers don't count as media. So we're not allowed to see those exhibits. We just have to read about them ourselves. That's stupid. Yeah, that's that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. like that, that, yeah. that, that, that's the type of stuff where it's like totally illogical. People are just not thinking when they when those decisions are made. Um, right. So so the the video is interesting because I, I feel like a lot of judges would let that video in, um, especially if you're trying to argue, oh, Rick, you would never do something like this. You don't have it in you. You're not that type of person. It sounds yeah. like that evidence has come out. So if he's threatening to kill other people, seems like that evidence might be relevant. Now, it's probably a lot more... Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I mean, it was hard fought. They, I mean, they spent a long time arguing about that and she finally came out with a ruling for them, but it was not an easy, it took yeah. a while. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely a bit of propensity evidence. It's definitely way more prejudicial than it's probative of proving anything in the case, like you said, mm -hmm. but I've had judges let stuff like that in, in the past. So that I'm glad she didn't. So that's, we'll give props where props are due. Right. So at least right. that seems like she made the right decision because it's not actually relevant. Um, so the state ends, it seems like not not a big surprise, you know, home run ending. But I think some of the last evidence was these confessions, which seem right. like the strongest part of the, the state's case. It's definitely not that bullet. It's definitely not the strongest part of the case. Right. Um, but then the defense starts. So what was kind of the defense's initial um, evidence that they're presenting in their case in chief? And did it seem to you like they had to change their um, strategy or their plan because the state ended a little bit earlier because sometimes that can throw off how you present evidence. And I've talked to a lot of juries and different or jurors in different cases after the fact, and they're like, we couldn't figure out why they called this witness or why it was out of order or things like that. Was there any of that at the beginning of the defense's case? I don't know if it had to do with timing, but they, it definitely didn't seem like it was a strong start. It seemed like there were, it, it's been very slow. The witnesses are really hostile to them. The prosecution is objecting all the time. The judge is ruling against them. It's just such a slow slog. And the very first witness out of the bat, they wanted to contradict that guy who claimed he had the van driving down the road with this report where he had spoken to an FBI agent and another agent and said, yeah, I, I in fact, you know, didn't come home right away. So I wouldn't have been home till five o'clock, not three o'clock, which would have been the time that it would have to have been something after three. But the guy, the guy got on the stand, very first witness, and, and he won't agree to that. You know, he's like, they even show him the piece of paper where it says inside the piece of paper, this is what he said. He was at the interview and he's like, yep, I fully remember that. That's refreshed my recollection. I have no idea, except I think he came straight home. 
was like, whoa, whoa. So they're, they're trying to get the FBI agent. But the problem is the FBI agent is in Texas and he's in charge of election coverage for the FBI in Texas. Hmm. So he's not available. They asked for him to be able to come by videotape and the judge said, no, that's not a good enough reason. That plus the fact that he has medical conditions, even those put together, she said, nope, the, you can't present him by video. So I don't know if they're going to be able to offer him at all. Yeah, they may not be able to get that fact in. Speaking of illogical, it's like, we can do everything today with technology, but for whatever reason that anybody would ever say no to legitimate right. evidence being presented to somebody accused whose life is literally on the line, but because you didn't you know, make a good enough argument for somebody to present by video, which like most courts, that's completely right. normal. And you know, you have to have a reason to not let them appear by video if they're not going to be able to appear. I mean, that just is so illogical to me, but okay. So that's how they started. What else is the defense presented? So they had... Um the former fire chief talked about got up there and he he couldn't he wouldn't agree to any of the things they were asking him and they mm -hmm. must have impeached him 10 different times the jurors were kind of like wow. at one point he's like on this question i guess i would say no what page because <laughs> he knew he was going to be <laughs> impeached and uh it, it wasn't even all that important a testimony it's just started off really slowly what i think they want to focus on and they haven't put it all together is the timeline. If you look at when, at when Libby took the video that everybody believes is the abduction, the beginning of the abduction of the girls, and when the cell phone of Libby is found underneath Abby's body the next day, it stops moving just 19 minutes after that video. Hmm. So that means if it's one person, they have only 19 minutes to go from the bridge, down the hill, through the woods, cross a creek that's a pretty big creek, go up the hill on the other side into a little wooded area, and then he has to kill at least one girl. And he's only got 19 minutes to do that because Abby falls on top of the phone and the, the police admit it didn't move again. She didn't move again. She lay on top of that phone until they found her body the next day. So that's really, really tight. And oh, that doesn't even include the girls taking off their clothes and switching clothes and, you know, Abby ends up wearing Libby's clothes. So that's a lot to do in 19 minutes for one person. He's a small man, five foot five, and they think he had a gun, but that's a lot. That's one of the reasons that the defense says this is more than one person, not one person. And you, you went down to that area, right? Is that right? I did. And I didn't go to the area where the girls actually their but where their bodies were found. I went down right. from the cemetery. They were below that. And then I went to, as close as I could on the other side. And I went to the Monon High Bridge, but that area is on private property that you would cross the creek to get there. So I haven't been there yet. And there are some ways you can go down. I'll probably go before I leave. But from your perspective, it wasn't something that was just a 30 second hop, skip and a jump. Like it was going to take really a minute. Not. Yeah. It's very steep, rugged terrain. And they have to cross a pretty th deep and thick creek there's a ford somewhere along there where it's a little shallower and they could have gone mm -hmm. across but abby was wet up to up to her midsection so her shirt and her sweatshirt were really wet along with her jeans which suggests she crossed the creek and in a pretty deep spot i mean that's a lot to do that quick and all yeah. that in the in that time he changes his mind if, if his confession is right right that isn't right. even his original plan but he ad adapts that quickly so before we get back to the defense's case, you kind of brought up a couple other questions I had. Um, number one, the van was a very important fact. What about the box cutter? I've heard that that was kind of an important fact that maybe people didn't know before. And the medical examiner now says, well, since he mentioned a box cutter, it could have been a box cutter that was used. Has that been as important of a revelation from these confessions or not, not so much because they, they can't actually confirm that that was the weapon used? None of the confessions that they put into evidence dealt with the box cutter. I remember hearing that too, and I'm thinking it must have been in the inmates' confessions, which they decided not to offer. So they don't okay. actually okay. have that in evidence. That that was a little questionable to me because initially th that had been deemed to be a serrated knife. That was important mm -hmm. for the defense because the medical examiner had said a serrated knife was used and a straight knife. 
again, two people, not one person, but they came up with a theory where even though it looked like serrations, it was due to the rubber ribbed grip on the box cutter. So that's their argument. It's okay. we've rare, we barely heard about that. That's just almost not even in here. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the Frank's memo off the top and we've talked a lot about the false confession stuff and the, the confinement, but we know that the defense believes there's evidence that a third party or parties committed this crime and it was not Richard Allen. Uh, we know that they have tried repeatedly to make those arguments. They have not been allowed to thus far. Has the judge made the decision on their um, new motion or no? She ruled out Odinism again. She said, oh, she you did. haven't proven enough for that. So I think as far as that's concerned, the answer is yes. They mentioned both Brad Holder mm -hmm. and Elvis Fields during that argument. So I think she's more or less ruled again. She's going to let them make a proffer so that the evidence is in when they go up on appeal. But I don't. she's not going to change her mind. That's my opinion. Okay. So based on that, knowing that that's not the case, you've mentioned a couple times the multiple people theory that they're trying to make this jury understand that multiple people committed this crime, not Richard Allen. It's impossible for just one person. Um, how much evidence have they put in of that? How many arguments have they made of that? Has there been any inkling? Because sometimes defense attorneys will do this, right? Where you're not allowed to argue this third party culprit. You're not allowed to argue Holder or Elvis or anybody else, specifically Odinism. But have they dropped little breadcrumbs of there was somebody else that does make sense that the cops should have investigated anything like that in this multiple person argument that they're making. They've not only dropped breadcrumbs, they've gotten three different law enforcement officers. Well, two. And then one of them said he was saying it on behalf of somebody else to say up until Richard Allen's arrest, we believed it was more than one person. Okay. So they, they also believe that not until Richard Allen confessed apparently did they think it could have been only one person when they made the arrest the prosecutor and law enforcement got up there and said hey this investigation is still open if you know anything or believe anybody else was involved you come to us so there was until his confessions i think they believed there were more people involved even law enforcement I think that's that's a great point for them that's a great point for the defense because if everybody investigating this case literally for years thought oh, there's no way this was one guy. And the only thing that convinced him it was one guy is somebody confessing from jail 13 months after being in solitary, or however many months it was that he was in there before the confession started. So I think that that's an interesting point and a good point um, from the defense's side that it's not just us. It's not just the defense saying it was more than one person. It's not just you juries who think, jurors who think maybe this was more than one person. It's like, no, no, no. Everybody investigating this case thought it was more than one person up, up until a guy said, nope, it was just me. And then that's all they needed because they wanted this to be over. They wanted justice for the community. They didn't want to be a laughing stock. They didn't want people looking at them saying, you didn't get justice for these little girls. They didn't want any of that. So when Richard Allen gave them their out, they took it basically. That's, that's part of the argument. Right. That's exactly what it is. And I, I, there are so many facts that suggest it's more than one person, like the fact that the blood on both girls ran from the neck toward the top of the head. Well, that doesn't happen if they're lying flat on the ground as they were found. It would mm -hmm. run to the side out this way or down their bodies if they're standing up, but instead it ran up. So that suggests they were tilted upward. So that means somebody's somehow holding the girl and cutting her neck, but she's tilted in that direction. And that was true for both. And it, you know, it just, a lot of things that just don't make sense. I mean, how's this small guy going to hold this, this girl this way while keeping the other from running off or screaming at, according to the timing right then, there were many people right there around the trails and the sound carried. So if they had screamed or yelled, it probably would have been heard. And the defense has gonna, done a good job of getting everybody there to say, I didn't hear anything. Yeah, I, I really think it's, it's all just so sad in the end when you think about the victims involved and where this is all going and how even if there's a conviction here, there's just so many questions that are not going to be answered for this family. And then when you think about Richard Allen's family and his wife's been in the courtroom, right? And what has that been like? Um, has she had any noticeable expressions on her face throughout the evidence? What are, what are your observations of that? 
She cried just nonstop through the confessions. Uh, she cried several times. Any time that something comes up, you know, related to his incarceration, his arrest, the interview, she has cried a lot. And through the confessions, she was just, it was the audio tape and she's crying on the audio tape and she's right there in person and she's crying hysterically. The jurors noticed one mm -hmm. juror looked over there and, and just, they had her on the interview and she's over here crying and he realized who she was because, you know, it was the same person. And then the next day, all the other jurors came in. And so a lot of them were looking at her during the confessions as she was crying. So I think that they put that together. We've also seen similar things from uh, Libby and Abby's family, particularly when they put pictures of the scene and the body up. It's, I mean, it's been a very difficult trial on many levels. And the jury's sequestered without they their are. loved ones around, dealing with these videos and pictures and this heavy, dark, scary, brutal testimony and evidence coming in. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's really tough to think about the headspace that they're probably in. I mean, thinking about everything you're going through and everything you're doing and you get to come home, you know, call anybody you want to talk to people on YouTube, watch some TV when you go to sleep. And just to think of what they're going through is it's a really tough situation to think about how they're perceiving this whole trial. And I think one of the coolest things about having you in the courtroom is you can actually see the jurors. And even when we get to stream, we don't see the jurors, right? We only see everything right. else that's going on in the court in the uh, trial. But while you're watching these jurors, I think you've already mentioned that they're, they're looking over at um, Richard Allen's wife. Uh, what other expressions have you, you know, learned anything from, or they're allowed to ask questions. And I've heard they've asked a bunch of questions. What are you learning from the way they're looking at this case? Do you feel like they have a lean yet based on some of their questions? I don't know if you followed the take care of Maya trial, but it started to be very apparent which way jurors were leading, uh, leaning based on their questions, anything like that in this case. They've asked really technical questions and very specific. Some of them are great questions. You know, hmm, that's a really good point. Someone should have asked that during the trial. Good job. And But for the most part, I don't feel like I have a sense of where they're headed on these. They asked one witness who was not an expert but had experience. She was a psychologist as well. And they asked her a whole lot of questions about the confessions. And they wanted to know what, you know, could, was it possible to be linear when you were in psychosis and what, but they basically wanted help interpreting and understanding the confessions. Those were super important to them. So I know that's what they're focused on from those questions, but they have a lot and of I questions. They want, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that's, that's a good sign that there's a lot of other stuff that came in the case and some of it you know, I, I know myself and some other lawyers and some other people watching are like, uh, is that really the strongest evidence? I know yourself included, like some of the stuff was contradictory maybe, or with the bullet, what does it really prove? What does it really disprove? But I, I think it's good that the jury is focusing on the confessions and it's going to be their job, whether we like it as lawyers or not. Just like you said, they came up with questions the lawyers missed. I love that because when we focus group before trials, or even when I'm talking about trials on YouTube, as I'm sure you do as well, they come up with points that you just didn't think were important or maybe missed. And what the jurors think is important is, is how it should be. And whether we like it or not, they are the finders of fact. They are going to determine were those true confessions? Were those false confessions? Was his mistreatment causing some kind of psychotic break and he just said it because of that treatment? Or did he mean it? They have the impossible job to try to look at all the context and all the other parts of the case and determine what, what is up with those confessions? What is the answer? Right. And they're going to have to make the determination at the end. You know, there's one thing different about this jury. I'm curious whether you've ever had this in a trial. I have not, but they're allowed to talk to each other now about anything that they hear at the trial. So they're, they have to be all together. They're not supposed to do it in little pockets or groups, but if they're all together, they can talk about the whatever they just saw, what the witness said. They can talk about the videos. They can talk about the confessions. I'm I'm not familiar with that. I've always had judges tell you know tell the jury not until the end. Never. I think that's a horrible right. idea. I, I think that's the idea of <laughs> I agree. Like, like, I look agree. Jurors, we're looking like for leader jurors that are going to be good for us. And you see some follower jurors. The leader jurors are going to have this thing lined up then. If that if that's the case, it's whoever the most powerful, strongest voices in the room are, if they start leaning one way, because we know it from trying cases where 
if you have the jury with you, they're going to believe what you say. Even if some of your evidence is like, ah, oh, that's not the best witness. Maybe they can impeach him a little bit. They're usually going to be like, oh, whatever. That impeachment was two years ago. He's testifying right now. Why is that other lawyer so mean? Or if they're against you, why is that guy so mean? Why is he asking those questions like that? I don't believe him. I don't believe his his, his witnesses. That happens all the time. So if they're starting to kind of formulate their opinions, it could absolutely affect the way they look at evidence coming in the future. And it may not even be their own opinions, but it could be just the strongest jurors in that room. What, what, do you, what is your thought on that? I completely agree. One of the things a defense lawyer said, as many would, is wait, wait until you've heard all the evidence. Please don't just make up your mind after you hear the prosecution, because we have a case to present. But I think this lead, lends itself to people making up their minds really early and people saying, yeah, we all believe those confessions before they've heard whatever the defense has to say. Today, they presented that evidence of Richard Allen where they could actually see him and see him walking around in the prison and what he looked like and Maybe that would change their minds, but if they've already talked about the confessions and already decided they believe them, then it's going to be hard for them to change. How hard is it to change, right? How hard is it to change your mind? So you go in that back room and you're like, I don't know. After listening to the defense, I'm not sure. I'm like, Lee, we talked about this at lunch two weeks ago. You were on board. You knew it. Remember that one where you said, I mean, that's, that's tough to get around because then, especially if you're a non-confrontational person, which... They end up on juries all the time and the other person's very confrontational. They'll be like, okay, you're right. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, we're good with the, like, do you really want to put yourself out there and fight with a strong personality when you're just not even sure yourself? I mean, that's a really dangerous process. I mean, that, that to me, but I, I get it with the sequestration. Maybe the judge is like, they're going to have all this time. Maybe they could talk about it, but I don't know, man. I don't, I don't like that at all. I don't like that at all. Apparently it's an Indiana thing. This is yeah. allowed in Indiana courts. So I'd anyway, be, that's how they're Indiana doing lawyers, it. Yeah. I'd be interested on uh, what Indiana lawyers think if they think it affects the process at all. Are there any Indiana lawyers in the courtroom besides the ones trying the case? I don't think so. I don't okay. think there are any who are just there to watch. No, nobody covering the case, for example. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting to me. So, um, so we've heard, the defense put on a couple witnesses. They put on the video of the conditions of the jail. Any other evidence they presented so far? They're just, what, two days? Two, three days? Yeah, just, they, they presented several witnesses, but it's been pretty slow. I don't think they made any big points. They're trying to put together a lot of different facts. Right. Their biggest, most important is trying to get rid of that confession. They're right. also going to have expert witnesses. We know those are coming. There's going to be somebody on ballistics. They wanted an expert witness who would come in and say, the entire concept of connecting this cartridge to the gun is nonsense, but they lost that witness. So the one they're going to have is going to say, your job, the judge ruled out that witness. But oh. the one who's going to come is going to say, you tried to connect these up and you failed miserably. This is not a direct connection to his gun. Okay. So they had two they wanted. One was going to be the bigger picture argument. How long is the defense's case in chief supposed to last? It was, they were going to have two weeks, but what we're hearing is that even including the proffer, it might be more like a week. So it could be as soon as, you know, mid to end of next week. And then of course the prosecution, I'm sure we'll have some rebuttal and then we'll, then we'll be going to the jury after that. Are, are they going to deliberate on Sundays as well? I guess that might be up to them. I don't know. The judge hasn't mentioned that. She's allotted and told them that this trial goes through the 15th. And she told him, and it might well be less. I thought, oh, never tell a jury that. Never tell them that because they're going to be so excited. Like, oh, yes, it'll be done. And what if it takes longer? But I, I think she's planning on it being shorter. And without all that third party culprit evidence, it probably will be. So mm -hmm. she's thinking that we'll be done within the next two weeks. She's promised them that. And she thinks it'll be sooner, including their deliberations. It sounds like she's right. I mean, from this, I from, think she's right. Yeah. What's happened so far. Um, I also think that the third party culprit proffer will be really interesting. I wonder if it sounds exactly yeah. like what we've already read before. Or I wonder if there's going to be new details, new evidence, if they're smart, which they are. I think they're going to put in a lot. I read that the motion that they just filed, which I thought it was very smart to put in stuff that's already come out at trial to open the door, which even adds fuel to the fire of why it was already relevant in the first place. I think it should have come in personally. And again, I think if the jury would have been able to consider that and they still convict Richard Allen, I would have felt more confident in that conviction. And because they didn't even get to see the full picture of what this looked like and why it was set up the way it was and these other people's connection, 
you know, again, it just puts a little, a little bit of shade on the entire trial, which I hate when that happens. And I always wish it didn't happen, but that's going to be a really interesting day when they proffer that evidence, um, to see exactly what they bring in from the trial that's already come out, what they bring in that they already had, um, and kind of projecting into how they would have argued it in the case. Um, do you know what day that's going to be? Is that going to be after the defense finishes? They haven't given us a day or when they yeah. plan to do it sort of in the, in the scheme of things. But one of the things she's given them the ability to do is just import what they did this summer. They don't have to present that again. There's, oh. there's reasons around the defense wanting to do that because there's one witness who's had a lot of change and they don't want that witness cross-examined. So they can just take that and dump it into this case and it saves the judge time, saves the jury time. So she said, yeah, you can just bring that over. So anything they present should be new might relate to the same topics, but it should be something new and different that wasn't presented in the summer. That's cool. That's cool. What are the la last thing I want to hit on is what are your perspective just kind of of the lawyers? How, how is the lawyering in the case? Um, and you know, any, anything that you take away that could affect the jury, the way they're presenting the case. I think the lawyers have been excellent. I mean, really, really excellent. They are just top notch, both sides. I do really, I really find the overuse of objections by the prosecution to be off-putting. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the jury necessarily feels that way. As a lawyer, though, I'm like, oh, come on. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just get the case out. And they they use them very strategically, and they object to everything. And I find that really frustrating. But I think the lawyers are great. I think they both are very, very, both sides, really skilled. They each have three lawyers per side, uh, two men and a woman on each side. And, and they're, they've divided it up and they've been really good. It's been, it's a fun trial to watch. You know, when you see really skilled lawyers doing their work, it's, you know, it's a pleasure to watch that if you, if, if you're into that and you like it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, you've mentioned also a couple of times that they're winning a lot of those objections. So sometimes the jury can be like, man, the defense must really be screwing up if they're having to call them on it and they're losing all these objections. So, oh, last question, actually, that I said the last one was, but the judge, right? So we've all had our feelings about the judge and some decisions that she's making. What is the presentation in front of the jury? Is it the same? Does it, is she showing disdain for the defense? Um, does she seem very heavy handed in favor of the prosecution or is most of that happening outside the presence of the jury? And she seems pretty balanced in front of them. In front of them, I would say she seems pretty balanced. She's very deferential to the jury. She's always respectful and kind to them. And really, really, the amount of drama that's inserted into the actual trial is pretty small, considering what we know went on in the background, all the motions to recuse the judge when she threw the lawyers off. You really don't see that in the courtroom. You do see mm -hmm. it in the rulings. Yeah, yeah. If, if, they're, if they're picking up on all that stuff, it's... Sometimes it can uh, make a difference. That's that's for sure. So anything else? Anything else you think is important? That's all the questions that I had. I appreciate you running through everything. I mean, it definitely feels like we're there and we get so much more information hearing from people in the courtroom than just like reading some tweets and doing some things here or there. So I, I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Well, thank you. And I just feel like this case is really important because I think it's sort of a test case for how we treat people and how we conduct trials and whether we believe they're public. So I'm so glad. I really appreciate your putting this on your channel. I know you have a big reach and I think it's great that people will find out more about it. Well, thank you so much for joining me and anybody wanting to find Lawyer Lee, that is her name on YouTube. Lawyer Lee, the handle is at Harvard Lawyer Lee. We didn't even talk about Harvard. Usually that's the first thing we talk about with somebody that went to Harvard. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and on Twitter, it's at Lawyer Lee W. Anywhere else people can find you where you're active? Is there anything else, Instagram or anything like that? Nope, that's pretty much it. Cool. All right. Well, you guys can all find her. Please go give her a subscribe, follow, like all the things and definitely check out her coverage of this case because you get a view inside the courtroom that we usually only get with cameras. Um, and it's, this is a case we need to pay attention to as a nation. Um, these are ways that we affect change and we're seeing it happen in other cases where the media and the public literally have an effect on cases like the YSL case in Georgia. And this could be another case like that. And just imagine if there were no cameras in that case, and that might be what's happening here. So pay attention. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Give this video a like. But that's all we got for now. Until next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. 
You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.